Uh, Donald Davidson, in a paper called A Nice Derangement of Epitaphs, Epitaths, uh, said, uh, or basically argued, that there's no such thing as language. And um, I've always sort of thought that you probably, you may not want to admit it, but on some level or other, you probably agree with that, right? No. In fact, I think he ended up contradicting himself. I think there's some discussion of it in here or somewhere. If you look at the end of the paper, it turns out he's presupposing that there is a notion of language in the technical sense, technical sense of an internal generative procedure that relates sounds and meanings and so on. Uh, he says there's no notion of language in another sense, uh, the sense of some community um, property or whatever. Well, okay, first of all, I don't even think that's true. It's just, it's not a scientifically usable sense. Uh, but I think the paper is just rife with confusions. I've written about it. So you think there are such things as languages? Yeah, yeah, like there are such in things. In an informal sense. Um, like there are such things as the meaning of life. You know, and I understand it when people ask, what's the meaning of life? So yeah, there's such a thing as the meaning of life. There's such a thing as the financial crisis in Argentina. You know, there are all kind of things in the world. But if you want to uh, proceed to understand what you and I are doing, those notions just don't help. You've got to look at it differently, the way we look at primates, and other primates, in fact. Well, let me read a quote from something you wrote recently, okay? You say, I doubt that people think that among the constituents of the world are entities that are simultaneously abstract and concrete, like books and banks, or that have the amalgam of properties we discover when we explore the meanings of even the simplest words, like river, person, city, Etc. Yeah. Um, you think that's the average a, that's person doesn't believe in that's cities? That's a technical question. Okay. It's a question if you try to figure out what a person's folk science is, you know, how people think the world is actually constituted of entities, which is not, do I talk about books? Of course, we talk about books. We talk right. about the meaning of life and so on. Right. But if you ask people, well, you know, how do you think the world really works? That's the problem with ethnoscience. Right. It's like you go to some other community and you try to figure out what what's their idea about how the world works, like maybe the classical Greeks thought that Apollo pulls the sun through the sky or something. That's their folk scientific picture of how the world works. Right. That's a hard topic. You can't just uh, do armchair philosophy about it. That's why ethnoscientists have to work. You know? And when they work, what they find, if, I think if they worked on people like us, instead of just talking about it in, a, you know, in the common room, uh, they would discover that our folk science, yours and mine, does not include entities that are simultaneously abstract and concrete, and does not include entities like the meaning of life. That doesn't mean we can't talk about it. I'm sure we talk about them all the time, but we don't, at least I don't, and I presume other people don't, think of them as constituents of the way the world operates. These are, we don't do that when we're talking to each other informally. Now, that, that sounds a little bit more moderate than, than what you've said elsewhere. Um, uh, here's a, a passage from, I, I believe this is from uh, New Horizons, where you say, in the domain where questions of realism arise in a serious way in the context of the search for laws of nature, objects are not conceived from the peculiar perspectives provided by the concepts of con yeah, common that's sense. That's absolutely right. Yeah. See, but there's several different enterprises you have to distinguish here. And I don't, I don't think it's more or less moderate. It's about a different topic. Uh, when you're trying to understand something about the nature of the world, uh, you and I, anybody, you start with some kind of what's called folk science. Almost every society we know has some picture of the way the world works, which is more or less commonly shared. If you try to do this more reflectively and carefully, uh, and uh, you know, bringing in other criteria and probably being, bringing in other cognitive faculties. We don't know that for sure, right. but I suspect it. Then it becomes the enterprise of science, which is a different enterprise and a uh, peculiar one. It's not folk science, it's science. That works in other ways. This comment has to do with our culture in which the enterprise of science is understood. Right. Uh, our, you know, intellectual culture, and in that, when we try to find out how the world works, we discard the concepts of common sense very quickly. But it sounds to me here like what you're saying is that the only things that are real 
right, are the things that science tells us are real. So yeah, you know, it sounds look, like what you're saying here is that, well, this table isn't real, but maybe, yeah, you know, yeah, quarks. Real is an honorific are. term. Okay. You can use it any way you like. I mean, to say that if I say <coughs> something is true and then I add, well, it's the real truth, I'm not saying there are two different kinds of truth, the truth and the real truth. I'm just emphasizing what I said. And the term real is basically used honorifically. Uh, so yeah, you can use it honorifically in various ways. Uh, if we're trying to find out the way the world works and to really understand it in the manner of the sciences, uh, we very quickly give up common sense notions. If we're carrying out folk science, you know, less reflectively, uh, probably using different cognitive faculties, we also give up common sense notions, but in different ways. Well, you can say a lot of, I mean, claims about something being honorific, like real being honorific. I mean, uh, Alan Gibbard, for example, has argued that terms like rational are honorific, or moral are honorific. Well, I don't agree with that. Okay. I think real is quite different. But what's the difference in these cases, then? Because I think rationality is something that we can understand, and morality is something real, and it's part of us, and uh, we can try to figure out what it is. We can try to figure out what our moral faculties are. We understand something about what rational action is. Uh, but about reality, we have to ask what we're talking about. Right. I mean, if we're talking about reality in the enterprise of trying to discover the way the world works in a physics department or a linguistics department or whatever, common sense notions are irrelevant. Well, if we're trying to explore our intuitive understanding of the way the world works, common, no common sense notions are relevant, but we discard them. If, uh, you have, if you're using it in a more informal way, like is uh, the meaning of life uh, real? Yeah, sure, okay. Well, look, there's a, there's a sort of space between ethnoscience and science, right, and common sense and all of those. And it's been explored by philosophers for, for 2,500 years, and it's called metaphysics, right? No, that's different. Okay. See, but, but, ethno but, but that is a question about what's ethno real, Ethnoscience right? is a branch of science. Right. Ethnoscience is the branch of science that tries to figure out what people's beliefs are about the way the world works. Right. Metaphysics is not that. I understand that. But okay. do you think that metaphysics is impossible? No, science is metaphysics. Oh, okay, good. You know, let's talk okay, about what good. the world is made of. All right. Yeah. So, but then the question is, why do you think that science gets to claim what's real? Now, let, let me give you an example. So, well, in the scientific image, Baslan Frassen is a scientific anti-realist. So, he says, yeah. the things posited by science, quarks, etc., are not real, but mid-sized earthbound objects are real. Now, you've got the flip side of that, I, right? I don't have any side because I don't think the word real is sensible enough to use. And they're all <coughs> real in different senses. If you're trying to understand the way the world actually works, whether you're a bus van Frossen or you or me, we're going to go to the scientists because they tell us how the world really works. If we're interested in exploring people's common sense beliefs, we'll go to the ethno-scientists well, and if, see what they discover. What if we're interested in something like whether there are events or whether yeah. there are properties or whether there are oh, um, mirological sums or something? Well, let's take events, which okay. plays a prominent role in modern semantics. Right. So here you can ask a lot of different questions. Uh, for one thing, you can ask whether in, say, Davidsonian semantics, uh, where there's a lot of, or anything that developed from it, event-based right. semantics, whether the things, wh whether what are called events are internal to the mind or outside the head. Right. But I think they're internal to the mind. Can't they be both? Well, they could, but then we're asking another question. Right. If we're asking, well, how do these things that are internal to the mind relate to something in the outside world, we'll say, okay, let's take a look at what you mean by an event. So, for example, is uh, the American Revolution an event? Yeah, it was an important event in history. Does that event include uh, the fact that uh, the man who the indigenous population called the town destroyer uh, took off a little time in the middle of the revolution to destroy the Iroquois civilization? Is that part of the event called the American Revolution? Well, not when you study it in school, you know. Uh, you want to find out about that event, you've got to, you, probably the Iroquois, remember, uh, but the ones who were left, or you've got to look at uh, serious scholarly history. Then you find out that one part of what was going on in the event that we call the American Revolution was uh, a side operation in 1979 to wipe out the Iroquois civilization so that the colonies could expand if they got rid of the British. Well, is that part of the event or isn't it? Well, you know, here come hard questions about what, you, what we're really going to call events in the outside world. And those questions don't have answers. 
because they are, uh, you know, they're highly dependent on our interests, our perspective, our goals, uh, you know, all kinds of factors. So I don't think we're going to find external events in any sense worth pursuing why for investigation the, why what the world is like. Why can't external events just be complicated objects? It can be anything you like, but it, is, is, is the town destroyer's exploit part of the American Revolution or isn't it? Well, that event. It well, sounds, you know, it's your ch choice. But that, there's no but, answer to that. Yeah, but now it sounds like you're saying that, well, I have representations of events. Right. The representations. No, I have representations. You have representations. I have representations, okay. uh, some of which we informally call events. Right. But now one might ask, what on earth is a representation yeah, if it's not a representation the, of something? Well, see, that's a mistake that okay. comes from a philosophical tradition. The way the term represent is used in the philosophical tradition, it's a relation between an internal object and an, ex, an ex, right. external object. Exactly. It's not the way it's used either in ordinary speech or in the sciences. So when, uh, when a perceptual psychologist, say, uh, talks about an internal representation of, um, you know, a cube or something, there doesn't have to be any cube there. They're talking about something that's going on in the head. In fact, what they may be studying, and usually are studying, uh, is a relation between things like kistoscopic presentations and uh, internal events. There's no cube, but nevertheless, they talk about it as an internal representation. I mean, the concept internal, rep there's a long discussion of sure. that in here. The concept internal representation is used in the sciences, and I think that's ordinary speech too, in ways which don't involve a relation between an internal thing and an external thing. Right. I mean, that derives from a particular interpretation of the theory of ideas, right. you know, which said, well, ideas represent something out there. I, I should interject here. Incidentally, that the, I should say that that's not the interpretation of the theory of ideas that were given by the people who used it. So like, say, Hume, for example. Uh, uh, I quote him in there. What he, he raises a serious empirical question. Uh, he says uh, it's about the nature of uh, um, the, he, he, the terms he uses, the identity that we ascribe to things, meaning how do we individuate things. Right. And he asks the question, well, is this a peculiar nature common to the thing, or is it uh, what he calls fictitious, uh, a construction of the mind? Right. And he says it's fictitious. There is right. no uh, entity, there is no common nature, there is no nature common to the but, thing. But there is a construction of the mind, which we used to talk about the world. But he's but not going to make things. I mean, he no, he's not an idealist. He was not an idealist? No, not, not here. He's saying, we interact. He believes there's an external world out there. There's a coffee cup on the table and so on. But he well, says that the, he's talking about the individuation of things, how we organize things, how we construct our picture of the world. Right. And that involves the way our minds work. Uh, and that doesn't mean the world isn't there. You know. It's just what his predecessors called our cognoscative powers, which use the data of sense to construct an account of the world. And he's saying, well, you want to look at the identity of things, the identity that we ascribe to things, like what makes us call something a book or an event and so on. He's saying, well, it's fictitious in the sense that it's a construction of the mind based on the data of sense. That's not an idealist position. In fact, that's the position of modern science. Because people will call you a crypto-idealist. Well, then they're misunderstanding what idealism is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me, th there's an issue that I wanted, I wanted to uh, get to here, and this involves the thing w we mentioned about representations and whether a representation requires there being something that it is a representation of. Yeah. Now in a very important and somewhat influential book by Saul Kripke, there's a revival of the sort of Wittgensteinian argument about, about rule following. Let me just read the relevant passage here. Yeah. So uh, in that book, Kripke says, if statements attributing rule following are neither to be regarded as stating facts nor to be thought of explaining our behavior, it would seem that the use of the idea of rules and competence in linguistics need serious reconsideration, even if these notions are not rendered meaningless. Now, I know you've yeah, I've written, written that. on that I mean, in uh, the Knowledge of Language. The crucial right? word is if. Right. Okay, and, uh, beyond, and the fact is that in the, way, in the sense in which the term rule is used in, for thousands of years, in fact, in the study of language, it's not the kind of rule he had in mind. So if somebody, if you read a book, you know, you study Latin, let's say, or you studied it a thousand years ago, uh, they would have a rule that tells you, uh, you know, when to use the ablative case or something. Right. That's not a rule in Wittgenstein's sense. It's a description of a part of the language. 
Right. It's, but so but the questions about rule following just don't arise. But, but we don't need to get hung up on rules and, and so well, forth. Well, but here. that's just, what he's talking no, about. I understand that, but in a certain sense, he's talking about any sort of computational state. That yeah. there. So take take just a computer. Right. right. Forget well, about human well, beings for a second. See, computers are a different story. Oh, see, right, okay. Let, let's but, but, take an insect. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. See, so what? What? Why aren't these right. questions asked about insects? Right. I mean, insects. When you study insects, you attribute to them computational states. Right. Is that a problem? I mean, is it not real? Like, if you say that an insect is doing, you know, is uh, determining the position of the sun as a function of the time of year and time of day, and here's the computation it's using, isn't that, why isn't that science? Uh, that would be, but the okay, argument fine. would be that the reason you can get away with that is because you're talking about what it's, com the, the, the representations that you're attributing to the insect are externalistically no, anchored. And that not. is, you couldn't that's, do it unless the, that's not it, true. you had an embedded system. That's not system. true. You could do it in an experimental situation in which you have uh, a light. And in fact, if you knew how to do it, you could do it by stimulating the uh, external sensory organs of the insect. It would all be interior. Uh -huh. and there's, there doesn't have to be a sun there. No, it's just that, yeah, you're talking about it the way it happens actually in the real world. But the same thing, you would say the same thing in an experimental setting where you don't have an external world. Well, because you're talking about the internal construct computations of the insect uh, on the occasion right. of sense. Notice doesn't matter what's out there. Notice, that's the, giving notice the, the shift there, though, because you went from saying uh, you you went from saying you don't need the sun in the experimental setting to saying you you, you don't say the you, same you could thing. Do, you could run the experiment in, in a world that didn't have the sun, and right. that's a different story, right? No, no, it's not a different story. The point is, if you look at what insect scientists are studying, they're studying what. 17th century philosophers used to call the constructions of the mind on the occasion of sense. Right. Now it happens that in the world that they're looking at, uh, the occasions of sense happen to be related to the fact that there's uh, something 93 million miles away. Right. But the study could go on as if it's what Hillary called a brain in a vat. Um, the studies are internalist uh, because we don't know anything else to study. But this is disputed, right? I mean, there is this dispute about David Marr, right? I mean, there's two stories on this. Tyler Burge and, and Martin Davis, for example, argue that Marr is sort of fraught with externalist sort of... Yeah, but they're just misreading him. Okay. I mean, in fact, the... Uh, uh, I have to know Marr personally, but I mean, I'm sure if he was here, he would say this. If you look at the informal exposition in Marr, in Marr's vision, let's say, book vision, you look at the informal exposition, in order to motivate what he's doing, he says, well, you know, imagine, uh, uh, you know, um, an elephant or something or anything like a stick figure. Uh, and you're trying to, f uh, you tr and you, we, we want to know how that thing out there is interpreted by the visual system as, uh, you know, some three-dimensional object. Right. However, if you look at the experiment, the experimental procedures of Mar, they, they didn't have uh, elephants out there. In fact, what they were using was stochistoscopes. Uh, and if they, so they were having, you know, dots on screens. Uh, and if they had known how to stimulate the optic nerve, they would have done that. Uh, when you go from the informal exposition to the actual science, you see that, like everything else, it's a study of the internal nature of the beast. Uh, and in fact, you know, in, they would have loved to get to the point where they could tell you something about how you identify a, you know, an elephant, but they never got anywhere near that. Uh, however, even if they did, it wouldn't matter whether the elephant is there or not. It wouldn't matter what sensory, uh, what's the occasion of sense. Again, the 17th century formulation of this was, I think, quite appropriate. On the occasion of sense, the cognoscative, it sounds archaic, but the cognoscative powers of the mind uh, construct complicated internal structures uh, which have all sorts of properties I and mean, gestalt properties uh, you know, uh, what Hume later called the uh, uh, identity that we ascribe to things and so on and that looks correct and that's the way modern science looks at it uh, the fact that the informal expositions uh, you know to sort of motivate what you're doing uh, talk about uh, identifying objects on the outside that's fine but you have to know how to distinguish informal expositions from the actual scientific program. And if you look at the actual program, they never looked at things outside, aside from tachistoscopic images, because they're as close as you can get to the occasion of sense.